we now have a panel um, with Jorge Vega, Rihanna Lube, and Hussam Aldin. So please welcome them. Hi. Um, Network Radicals, thank you so much for, for being here. Um, and thank you, Sara and Erika and the uh, Radical Network team for inviting us. Uh, my name is Jorge uh, Vega, originally from Puerto Rico, and I am joined by uh, Rihanna Ilube uh, from the UK and Hussam Aldin from uh, Syria. Uh, we're all uh, currently living in Berlin. Uh, and today we are talking about mobilizing diasporas uh, and why this matters in the context of, of Radical Networks. Uh, first things first, um, we know that this is a conversation and there are people here that potentially are already working with diaspora communities or themselves are from diaspora communities. So uh, to break up the format a little bit, we have a fourth seat, uh, lower but not by design. Um, and during the talk, if you feel that you have a point that you want to contribute, uh, we welcome you to just stand up and sit here. Uh, with the kind request that once you feel that you've contributed, that you open up the space for another person that might want to uh, participate. So, um, before we start the panel, uh, I'd like to give a preface of why I wanted to convene today's conversation. Uh, uh, last uh, September 20th uh, in 2017, uh, Hurricane Maria uh, became the strongest storm to make landfall in Puerto Rico in 85 years, uh, the 10th most intense Atlantic hurricane on record. Uh, the results were catastrophic uh, to an island already experiencing financial crisis. Uh, three months after the hurricane, 45% of households still didn't have electricity. Uh, more than 2,900 people died because of the hurricane or in the aftermath. Uh, I was part of a group of Puerto Ricans uh, abroad that quickly mobilized, uh, guided by the uh, ideals of, of decentralized response and, um, and mutual aid. Uh, after some, some trial and error and guided by volunteers with experience in organizing disaster response as part of the Occupy Sandy movement in New York, uh, we were able to create a structure outside of Puerto Rico to support community-led community mutual aid centers popping up in the island, uh, which were offering food and medical attention, often in place of a mediocre response by the local government and by the U.S. federal government, which controls Puerto Rico as a de facto colony. Uh, very quickly thought, though us in the diaspora had to collectively learn um, how to navigate or respond to political situations, we or the groups we supported on the, on the ground faced, uh, like government intervention, um, and later uh, other themes like displacement. Uh, the diasporas are powerful identities, uh, straddling the formal and the informal, stretching the gray zones of international law and the uses of available technology. Uh, and we can learn from them how to operate as networks in today's world precisely because of their globally distributed na nature. Uh, perhaps an interesting analogy comes from uh, Senor Marx, uh, who defined capital as value in motion or movement. Uh, when we talk about social capital, uh, could we also define it based on the kind of movement or motion the human or social elements take? Uh, diaspora communities are already a large force. And we are already seeing growing trends in displacement due to conflict or natural disaster, which will probably create more diaspora communities. Chances are that large-scale involuntary migration be, will be one of the defining characteristics of the challenges we will face in the next century. Um, and thus, diasporas will be a major factor in the coming uh, global order. For us, uh, incubating radical networks, uh, uh, right now, the, the imperative to learn from diasporas and what's happening in global, mi in global migration is critical uh, because it is a preview uh, of the type of, of insidious, tech-powered oppression that many of us might experience someday. Now I'm happy to introduce my co-host for today. Uh, Rihanna Ilube uh, grew up in London and moved to Berlin in January, January 2018. She is currently events manager at Bekesh Anti Cafe, where she curates a series of discussions and workshops exploring black diaspora experiences across Europe. 
Uh, she graduated with a politics degree from Cambridge in 2015 and has spent the last few years working as a project and community coordinator with youth organizations in the USA, Ghana, and UK. She has curated and facilitated a wide range of trainings, events, and exhibitions, often focused on the themes of migration, technology, and political engagement. Um, she will speak to us today uh, about recent developments in the Caribbean black British diaspora, uh, such as mobilizing around the recent uh, Windrush controversy. Uh, and Hussam al -Din. Um, well, in his native Syria, uh, Hussam worked as a language and political sciences professor and as a producer, local liaison, and translator for international media such as the BBC, ABC Australia, Al Jazeera, and France too. Together with international film crews, he filmed documentaries and segments on social issues in Syria, notably the situation of Iraqi refugees. He was arrested five times, after which he finally fled abroad. He's been living in Germany since 2012 and continues to work as a freelance producer and research assistant for radio and television projects covering topics throughout the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, and he'll speak to us um, about diaspora narratives, his experience in using channels like WhatsApp uh, to aid Syrian refugees uh, crossing the Mediterranean, as well as mobilize those still trying to escape the conflict. Uh, so thank you both, and uh, yeah, and uh, let's start. Uh, so first of all, obviously the theme is uh, radical networks, uh, and I just wanted to sort of get your perspective um, on why is it important for people that are trying to think about how to keep networks radical and political mobilized, why is it important for them to understand how diasporas are mobilizing right now? Okay, um, thank you for the introduction as well. I feel like I, go, I, I often am in a lot of spaces to do with the black diaspora, in Germany and both in the UK as well. Um, and now I'm in this space and I've been coming to a lot of the talks in the last two days. Um, and one thing I'm wondering is when I'm with black people in the UK and we're talking about activism and talking about the kind of things that we're trying to do in London or for things that are happening abroad, I feel like there's a lack of knowledge about the kind of things that are being spoken about in this space. And um, part of what I'm interested in this discussion and what I'm trying to understand is how can members of the diaspora who sometimes don't have access to um, a lot of the kind of big tech spaces or knowledges. Um, I worked in big international development charities where often I was the only black person in the room um, in the UK, in London, one of the most multicultural cities um, in the world. And I want to make sure that we learn from each other and the things I learn here, I can bring into other spaces and vice versa. Um, and one project that I've started doing recently and can talk a little bit more about is just interviewing people from the black diaspora in the UK. So started with my grandma and um, talking to my friends and friends of friends and finding out what they think about technology. How do they use Facebook? Are they nervous or scared about surveillance? And do they know about the other platforms that you guys have been speaking about for the last two days? Um, and yeah, I would just like to bring those spaces closer together. So that's one thing. Thanks. Sorry, I'm not well today, so forgive me a bit. I'm very glad to be here, to be honest. I came from Syria, from a little town called Hama. This Hama, it's uh, completely destroyed this city in three weeks. And 47,000 people killed and nobody knows about it. I'm very interested here, you know, to share information, to be around a lot of interesting people from different countries, you know, different places. I was traveling a lot to many countries just to exchange experience, to exchange, uh, you know, backgrounds a little bit, to know a lot about each other. There's a lot of people, they don't know so much about Syria, only like a general frame, let's say, general ideas. And I'm here to answer for a lot of questions. So actually, let me let me jump from that and start with you, Hussam. Um, 
Uh, you work with international organizations in Syria, even before the, what's considered the Syria crisis, which actually started with a lot of Iraqi refugees coming into Syria. Um, uh, as, as someone working with international organizations, um, was, was, was there a difference in how they navigated um, or responded to the crisis as opposed to how local groups or Syrian groups responded? Well, I'm allergic from uh, international <laughs> organization, to be honest, very sensitive. They always we have a lot of problems together. And I don't want to say I work with them, but I was kind of um, putting my nose in a lot of works. So what I would like to mention about uh, from Iraqi time, like from 2003, a lot of Iraqi, more than 3 million Iraqi refugees went to Syria. So I created a small organization to support them by my international students. I used to teach political science and also Arabic. So my students were kind of a, a social activist. And it was nice to be with the people. But what I realized from United Nations and a lot of big organizations, it's quite big corruptions, a lot of expenses for like no need to be honest, like to spend a lot of money for stupid things. I saw a lot of people selling the like uh, the food or the things because it's not eatable or it's not good quality or something like that. So like they buy, for example, one bag of rice with hundred dollars, the United Nations, and then the refugees sell it by ten dollars, for example. It's just like wasting money. It's a lot of story like that. A lot of people get this, a, a settlement like somewhere and they pay money under the table. There's a lot of injustice with that actually. And it, now about Syria, let's start from Syria. Of course they will react to get, like, you know, collect money from everywhere. United Nations started in Syria in 2011 also during the revolution in Syria. Unfortunately, you know, they were quite so weak and they gave up to the order of the regime, you know, and the regime played very dirty game that's to make the people starving, actually. And the United Nations here, they have to make a deal. Either you give up or we don't give you food. And that's the role of United Nations, unfortunately, and many organizations. I know a lot of leaders from many organizations, they are close friends and they told me the same stories, that we cannot do anything, you know, everything controlled by Syrian regime. And the Syrian regime created an, an, uh, also like a kind of something, it's called Red Crossing and Al Hilal Al Ahmar, and this is belong to them, actually. Even his, the, you know, the wife of Al Assad has, her own organization gets support from United Nations. And uh, his cousin, the big thief, is called Rami Makhlouf. I don't know if you know about him. He also like run big organization, gets supported by United Nations. A lot of things, you know, it's become like 96% exactly according to the like, you know, Guardian. They say that all the like support goes to the Syrian regime and 4% to like refugees or the people who get, you know, this disaster. And uh, what's happening, it's really not fair at all. You know, it's they are supporting regime with uh, the, who's supposed to have the, like a boycott from the international, you know, community and United Nations, America and Europe. But those companies, it's supporting the army to killing people. And you can see the food, even a lot of food, like the boxes from United Nations, it's certain from United Nations, help from United Nations, and you can see it at the market. They sell it to normal people. You can see it at the checkpoints, you know. The soldiers of Al-Assad, you know, they are like using this food for themselves, you know, and this is what's happening right now. Thanks, and obviously, I mean, the, the, the question is, obviously, we're from the outside, and uh, often a lot of these international organizations work on our behalf, uh, but obviously, they're apparently not really doing a good job. Um, I want to pass it on. Uh, Can I add yeah, yeah, please. Sorry. I was in Greece, and I was coordinator for six organizations, and they were fighting together. Most of the organization fighting together. For example, we, I, we were in Kos, this island, and there's a lot for example, uh, a lot of people would like to help and support and something, like that, but they don't let old people helping, for example. We have, for example, lunchtime. 
Most of the organization would like to give lunch time, but nobody would like to give the breakfast or the accommodation or something like that. Okay, you have money to help, not only just to focus about something. You, there's a hole, we have to fill it everywhere, you know, that's where is in need. You know, the money we have to put it in the right place. What I see, it's competition, gathering information, and this is, uh, to be honest, it's not like a professional work. It's just like a, uh, something you hide behind. That's it. You, when you need something from. No, thanks. Um, so I mean, no, that's a perfect segue, uh, Rihanna, because you've worked um, uh, from a global perspective. Uh, maybe uh, organizing efforts that would run in parallel with what big international organizations are doing. So maybe you also have a vision for. Uh, where the gaps are, especially when it seems that they're not really tapping the local network, the people that can navigate uh, those scenarios. Um, any any thoughts on that? Uh, and any examples of people that are really doing uh, a good job or doing a bad job or can inspire us around a better way to tapping that for us? Cool. Um, okay. So for. Uh for context, I worked for a youth-led international development agency in London, and it's based across Africa and Asia, and the headquarters are in London. And I think in the UK, a lot of the big org international development organizations are HQ'd in London, so you've got like Oxfam and Save the Children and all of these big names. And one thing I found when I was working at this organization is that crises would happen, for example, in um, the mudslide in Sierra Leone, and then suddenly they'd come to me and be like, okay, do we have Sierra Leonean diaspora youth in our networks? Because we, these are the people, there's so many in London and in the UK, um, can we mobilize them quickly and figure out how to support what's happening over there? Um, and I found that there was just this, gap because we these organizations hadn't done the work working with these communities before and suddenly when we realized we wanted them we couldn't work out how to reach these networks that do exist um, and I found this quite just a difficult environment to work in and I was talking to one girl who also is a British Nigerian works for another one of these big organizations um, and she's like where are the black people and we um, and I think there's a lot of barriers to getting into these spaces and lacks lack of communicating however um, a good campaign that I do know of in the UK is called um, Youth Stop AIDS and it's led by a friend of mine who um, is British Caribbean, has family members affected by HIV, and they've done a really good job of kind of finding members of the diaspora who are across the UK who are affected by these issues, who can talk about their lives and connect with their families back home or back in these other countries. And we do speaker tours around the UK. People also have flown in from um, vice versa and I think it's a good example of how they use, also use technology, Facebook groups, and to mobilize and create those global communications. But you have to kind of design it from the beginning, knowing you want to work with these diaspora movements. So this is one. Thanks, and I, I think that brings a very interesting angle, which is uh, people in a diaspora usually are the brokers of information. Um, Hussam, I wanted to pass that to you because um, I know that uh, given your work that you were already doing in Syria, uh, before you left, um, you were you were kind of a navigator. You no, know? you you knew how to go from let's say government control areas to places that were not controlled by the government. Uh, when you left, uh, I think you told me that you had over 400 channels of direct links to different villages, and you sort of like became a knowledge broker with something as basic as WhatsApp to know what was on the ground. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the experience of of how a Syrian that was escaping Syria? How would they use uh, WhatsApp? How do they know how to, how to contact? How do those um, numbers get spread? And how do you deal with things like misinformation, fake news, or even surveillance from the government? Sure. Uh, well, we'll start before WhatsApp. In 2011, as you see, most of the like Arabic Spring started with the Facebook, actually, especially the Egyptian like revolution, and it was the biggest number actually gathering. And then, as you know, before that, even at the the Green Revolution in 
and Iran in 2009 is the same things by the Facebook. So the Facebook become kind of enemy for most of the intelligence offices or something like that in the uh, many governments around all Arabic countries. And of course, a lot of people they don't know, uh, like from the government, let's say they don't know a lot about uh, like uh, social media. So they were against anybody has a Facebook account. Can you imagine that it's uh, it's for them scary because people can gather each other around in any square and protesting, and this is the only way. We are in Syria according to like uh, we call like emergency law. We are not allowed to be like four or five people walking in the streets. You know they can arrest us with without even to send us to the court or like this kind of things. It's from the 60th actually, this kind of law. So of course it's very hard to gather each other except a mosque or like churches or something like that. And it was not easy of also because most of the like imams or the, it's like working for the, for the government. So it started from the Facebook and slowly, slowly, of course, we start as a Syrian. I'm very glad about that. Even, I don't want to say we failed, but at least for me, it's an honor that I was a part of this revolution and like for, uh, for our generation. It's not for actually for only us, you know, for the next, you know, two or three generations in the future, maybe we can get, you know, get, you know, get uh, some, good result. I'm not expecting a lot, but what I would like to mention that we we used also Skype. Skype, I was caught by the police by the Skype actually. I was correspondent for international channel and then this was I was explaining about what's going on in one area and then I found out the police behind me, even not the police, it's international, uh, it's uh, like a security police. So I found them behind me. So I paid a lot of money to get out from the jail because most of my colleagues were like missing or died, uh, we don't know nothing about them. Anyhow, I paid everything I have and then I went out, so I went outside of, you know, Syria. But what I would like to say, Skype it was also mono, mon, like monitoring uh, even our like uh, Facebook. You know, if they if they arrest any person, they will check all his account, so they will get all his friends. Anybody says hi to him or put a like or well, I'll share or something like that, they arrested him. So it's quite it was positive side and the negative side actually, and slowly slowly we don't trust Facebook and Skype. So it starts the new things it's whatsapp whatsapp it's more easy you can change the like numbers you can change a lot of it's, it's like a program you know it's from place to place but also the government actually they create something called the electronic army and which their job to fake a lot of news and to publish it by whatsapp and or even Facebook, but mostly like by uh, WhatsApp, and to know where's our places, you know, and uh, all the media centers, you know, we have in each village, in each places, you know, some the thing we call like a media center, just like to support us with information, what's going on, and to support other area also. So of course, WhatsApp it was very important and. As we say, it's like a Facebook, you know, negative point and positive point. But the question, who's supporting the government with monitoring our, like, private, let's say, our privacy? They, you know, they are monitoring us by the Facebook or Skype or emails or something like that. So I found out that a lot of companies from Germany, from Italy, from America, from Belgium, all of them is just like a business for them. They don't care how many people killed because of this stupid machine, you know, to like monitoring people, you know. This is, I think, you know, it's injustice for that. Like we are until now silent. We didn't do any things, you know, even the, like, it's just a business for them. It's like selling weapons. It's for me, it's the biggest weapons that's monitoring, you know, but it's more than the chemical, you know, like weapons, which also the a, a product getting from Germany and from France. And I'm so sad about that and nobody like,
talk a lot about that. It's very important, I think. You know, it's very even Angela Merkel last time they were like, uh, you know, they said they were monitoring her phone. So, so she, she's not using like, for example, like a smartphone. So it's there's no privacy anymore, and this is what is scary. Actually, we have to react for that. We have to stop those, you know, company making business of our people. You know, a lot of people killed because of them, and I will never forget that. Uh, we miss a lot of colleagues, a lot of things, a lot of massacre happened because of this, you know, technology, stupid technology, which we can use it for positive side. Thanks. Um, <laughs> thank you, Hussam. Uh, I wanted to then uh, explore another angle, um, and I kind of like, uh, which apparently it's not by design, uh, the, the great presentation by Giselli before and the presentation that Matilda, um, that they will be doing after us, is kind of like a theme on, on how do you activate different uh, groups to be mobilized. Um, and I'm interested in hearing about what happened with Windrush um, uh, in terms of tapping into what potentially was not really a self kind of recognized diaspora group, especially with people that were second or third generation, uh, and how technology, how consumer technologies were, were used or not, were co-opted or not by activists to sort of create this narrative and own that narrative. Can you tell us something about that? Um, okay, so for those who haven't heard of the word Windrush before or this movement, essentially after the World War II, um, the UK needed workers and opened it up to members of the Commonwealth and I think of almost half a million people came um, in the 1950s, 60s and early 70s to come and work in the UK. Um, this is the boat, the Windrush, um, it's the first boat that came with migrants from the Caribbean. Um, my grandma arrived in 1957, I think, as a single 23-year-old woman. Um, and a lot of these people, they worked on the buses, they worked in the National Health um, Service, they did a lot of the kind of jobs that British people didn't want to do or want. But they were given right to stay forever, for the rest of their lives until 1971. And, um, the people who arrived before 1971 were British citizens. So it was like, okay, cool. And then in the last few years, reports had been coming out that many of these people who had arrived on these kind of boats were being deported back to the countries where they came from. So people were getting sent back to Jamaica, people were losing their rights to work, their right to health insurance, they lost their houses, and these are people in now in their 60s, 70s, 80s, um, my grandma's generation, and a bit younger. And the reason was, is because in the last couple of years, Theresa May has created a policy called the hostile environment, and I think Brexit is part of this, um, where, she says, we want to make it as difficult for people, migrants, to exist in England. And as part of this, um, we are going to make it very, you have to stringently prove that you are British. Unfortunately, a lot of people who arrived in the 1950s had the right to be British, they are British, but weren't given the correct documents. Um, and they never applied for passports because they never had a need to travel outside of the UK again. They weren't able to afford to or they just stayed in the UK. And so now they come into their 60s and 70s and suddenly don't have um, the right documents. And the government says to prove they're British, they have to show four pieces of documents for every year since 1971. Yeah. Um, and so you have finally found all these grandmas and grandpas trying to find these documents that they don't have. So that's the context. Um, the other good thing about what happened is that these people who came, my grandparents, and um, created this huge British Caribbean diaspora community in the UK, um, and there's so much culture around it, and there's so many people of second and third generations. Um, and so this was an interesting period because suddenly third generation people like myself 
who, born and raised in Britain, never thought necessarily that we are not British, maybe you have the passports, are suddenly having family members and people that you know of being told you're not British and being deported back. Um, and in a way, potentially, this was another awakening of thinking, oh, we are members of a diaspora, and how do we do this? And so a huge movement started, and the Guardian newspaper took this on as an issue and started every week for the last couple of years or last year and a half producing reports about what was happening to individuals um, who were being deported or affected. Then this politician, David Lamy, who is the children, uh, the child of a Windrush, um, Windwash parents um, started taking this on on Twitter massively and it went completely viral. A lot of other politicians started getting on. So yeah, here he's talking about a letter, someone saying like, you should be break grateful that you're a black man in this country. There's a lot of racism in, in the UK um, that came out in this hostile environment that we were living in. And then I think over the last five years, in general, you've seen online young people, young black people in the UK have been building this massive kind of a movement of like black Twitter and um, black led media outlets called Gaudem, Black Ballads, where people are really writing their own stories, doing their own research, talking about what's going on. So there was kind of this infrastructure in place of people who are young people talking about black British identity who now could start amplifying it on behalf of their grandparents and um, yeah and their parents and things like this that were happening so this yeah this was interesting and when I was interviewing people um, like there's this one or there's this one girl who wrote I always felt quite removed from my Caribbean heritage. I think for a lot of our grandparents and parents, they weren't very open about their stories. Um, and now's the time to try and get them to talk and to fight for them in a way. And um, the, being on this panel has made me think a lot about, yeah, do I feel this massive connection to Jamaica? Would I fight for Jamaica after my grandparents being in the country for 80, like in for the last 60 years, and it definitely has made me think, feel a lot more part of a diaspora when a crisis hit like this in the UK. So for now, I'll leave it at that. Great, thanks. Um, we are on the tail end of our allotted time, so I definitely wanted to make sure if there are any questions or comments, uh, we welcome those uh, right now. So, so one question that often comes up with diaspora is how the people in the, um, uh, in the country of origin um, feels about the people who are in the diaspora. Um, 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 the people in the diaspora are often doing tremendous work as, as you both are doing and the communities that you represent. And I wonder, to, to my knowledge, there's, there's sometimes some resentment that, that you know, you represent those who have gotten out, as it were. And, and how, how do you negotiate that? How do you um, um, uh, navigate around that? So, as you know, like Sylvan, we are 20, uh, 25 million inhabitants. Half of the people left Syria. And we have more than four or five million also inside Syria, but in different places actually, so they are also not settled. Of course, some people took advantage of this situation, as you see. A lot of people left their home, their land, their business. So, of course, people get benefit of that, but other people, of course, our, like, you know, their heart, it's with us and they communicate but it's not an easy way actually, you know? And as you know, everything under control, and this is the problem. It's very high risk, always like that. There's, I have a lot of families members there, and it's very hard to communicate with them even. So of course they feel like uh, sad, you know? It's completely not that easy for you know, both, you know, both sides, you know? There's a lot of families, half of the family here, the other half, there, you know, a lot of couples have there, the children there, or whatever, the, even people send their own children here and they are still like stuck here, for example. So it's crazy. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, it's, yeah, it's, 
I think it's yeah, it's different for every um, person and the different groups. So, for example, my dad's side of the family is Nigerian, um, and I was talking to a few other Nigerians as well. And for example, my dad said when he moved back, to, he came to England, and it was seemed seemed at that point that you had to maybe take away the Nigerian side of yourself and focus solely on making it in English culture and trying to not talk about it so much or big up the fact that you're Nigerian in this way. Um, whereas now maybe with my generation, there's now, you're also like, I'm British Nigerian and there's this massive kind of cultural thing of pride. However, then I was talking to another British Nigerian girl who said, then she meets Nigerian Nigerians who are in the UK and they say, you're not Nigerian, like you're, you are English. And it's just this classic um, frust frustration. And I think um, in terms of the Jamaican aspect, what was w interesting is that a lot of the arguments that the elderly people were saying is, we are British, we're not Jamaican, we haven't been back in Jamaica since I was six years old. And trying in a way to say, you know, I'm very, I'm very English and I deserve to be English. But then the people of my generation being like, we're British Caribbean and we're not gonna let this happen to our grandparents and this is our heritage and this is our flag. So it's this kind of negotiating how proud, proud, you, proud, proud you are at any different time for political ways as well. I would, I would just say uh, something that was uh, interesting, uh, if not a little bit fucked up, uh, after the hurricane happened in Puerto Rico, there was already an economic crisis. So there was already a narrative of people that had to leave Puerto Rico because they just wanted a, a, a livelihood. Um, and afterwards, uh, after the hurricane, there was this seemingly viral campaign that came up saying, yo no me quito, I don't give up that start creating a narrative of the people that supposedly were resilient and they just wanted to, to, to stay, right? Uh, and it was conflictive because we all, we all speak about resilience, we all speak about pride of the homeland, of staying there, of rebuilding things, especially after a disaster, but there are people, uh, especially when you have to take into consideration that uh, people across the socioeconomic spectrum are affected, but only the people that have the means potentially are the ones that can leave. Um, and uh, some people took advantage, I think, of some resentment that already was happening of people from with different socioeconomic uh, classes and then kind of extrapolating that after the crisis uh, in a way that disruptive the, let's say, the unity or the potential, the potentiality of the diaspora community to activate themselves for, for Puerto Rico. And I think like that's something that uh, yeah, you see in, in different diasporas. Uh, we may have Time for just one more question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your uh, panel. Um, the question is for Hussam. Um, did I understand correctly that you said uh, it seemed like more people uh, disappeared or were killed because of electronic surveillance and what that enabled than from attacks, like chemical attacks? Is that what you said, first of all? And secondly, how quickly did people realize that was happening? Like that that was the way they were being like hunted by the government and then killed? Like how, was it a scale of weeks, months? Yeah. Well, you know, th you know thank you for your question. It's very important actually. We knew that before actually, we have a big experience with the Syrian regime. Actually, even before the Syrian like war, actually we have this, we are always afraid to speak on the phone because always we say like the world has a like end, you know, that this is the, you know, you know, the problem. We are scared always, but we don't have other you know options we need to react we need to do something of course there's a lot we we found out that a lot of people a lot of activists missing suddenly if they found one person they, it's easy to find 100 or 200 people after that they can follow their like uh, like their account and story story they get you know the whole network and this is what's happening in 2011 and 12 most of the important activists people missing. You know, we have a lot, like more than 250,000 people missing. We don't know nothing about them. More than a million people killed, half million injured, and there's a lot of, 
you know, complicated stories. For example, just like by coincidence, we found that one of the failed hospitals explode. How, you know? Of course, some people, they support, they have some spy or something, or they were like absorbing us, you know, they know the location of the place. And many failed hospitals, I was working with MSF, we built more than 70, like, you know, failed hospitals in Idlib and, 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 and Aleppo in 2012. And most of them, it's completely destroyed by air forces. It's not in the coincidence, and this is what's happening. I hope it's fine. Great. Um, I think that's the time that we have. Obviously, I encourage you to talk to these uh, two amazing people uh, during the break that we have right now. Uh, and for now, thank you so much for being here. Thanks.